Hey everybody, it's Costum with your daily Google News, which is something I'm testing out here. And I am uh, here with one of my new favorite people in the whole wide world, Amit Cabra. Amit, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I, uh, I'm excited to chat with you. You, just so you know, are like a local celebrity in our agency. <laughs> I know, I actually didn't realize it until maybe a week or two ago when uh, one of your, I guess she's an account manager, Erin, actually sent me screenshots of a conversation that you guys <laughs> that's too funny yeah yeah aaron's our newest cm and then leandra who runs our client management department they're both they're both canadian and i guess like in canada you have occupied the space of google ads or ppc thought leader i would like to believe so i think it's more western canada than anything i'm working on the rest of canada that's kind of my goal really at this point but um yeah it's been interesting it actually it's almost like I fell into it, which is kind of a weird thing. I never like actually thought this is how my life would end up happening or like how I would end up like going through my career in any way. Uh, it was just me showing up to like random meetups in Edmonton where I was living for about eight years. And then suddenly I started going to like the UX ones, the web dev and content and social media meet meetups because nobody had PPC. I was like literally the only person in the city at that time doing them. Uh, so it was really weird. So I just always just showed up to random things and then slowly everybody was like, I meet the Google girl, I meet the Google girl. Uh, and that's how AdWords girl kind of came out. So I was like, okay, well, might as well, like, let's go with it now. Like, my head, right? And you don't just do Google, right? You, you, you Google, Facebook, Instagram, yeah. obviously, because Instagram and Facebook live together, Twitter, like what other platforms am I not naming? Uh, we've done a little bit on Snapchat and LinkedIn, but a, predominantly our experience is mine or my experience is predominantly in Google ads. So that's where I started, I want to say like 12 years ago at this point. Uh, and then we added in a couple of Facebook managers. And I also have been doing that for myself. Well, not myself, but I've been doing that myself for five, six years now. Okay. So we predominantly do Google, Facebook, Instagram, and then a little bit of LinkedIn now. My experience with LinkedIn has been a little fuzzy like I, i'll tell you my story and you can tell me if you think it's if i'm doing something wrong if i let's say i go to google facebook and linkedin with a niche audience and i'll give each of them a thousand bucks and google will come back and say hey we can only spend 600 and facebook will say hey we can only spend 850 and linkedin says spent it and like yeah. what else you, and in my mind i'm like you're a fraction of the size how is this how like i don't tr i just don't trust their their traffic or their algo at all no, it's kind of hard just because it's so expensive. So we don't really recommend it to a lot of clients because a lot of our clients are looking for quick wins really off, right off the bat. So I never feel comfortable with adding that in as the first um, platform that we go to just because I'm like, I know this is going to take like two months for us to do and it's going to cost you thousands of dollars before you start seeing anything. Uh, and obviously that's not something a client really wants to hear. So I'm like, let's go to the platforms where we know we can win and then move off into LinkedIn eventually at one point. But I really do like their um, account-based marketer matching, I think they call it, ABM, whatever, matching or marketing, whatever the one it is for the acronym. Because uh, it actually is, it's very much like a lookalike audience, but you're actually finding those exact people on LinkedIn, which is mm -hmm. really, really fascinating to me. So those tend to work really, really well. And then the remarketing campaigns obviously do pretty well. But the cold audience is some kind of, we're, we'll st we're still testing it out. We'll see how it works. <laughs> yeah. So with ABM, will it work with conversions that take place outside of LinkedIn? Like can LinkedIn monitor and see your Google and Facebook conversions and then bring that into the LinkedIn ecosystem? Not that I know of quite yet. So that's kind of one of the other things that we have to still work on. LinkedIn is still pretty new for us. So I'm still learning it, I guess. But the few clients that we do have on it have been seeing relatively decent results, but I think a lot of the gaps that we have to fill are through analytics really at this point and just kind of figuring out what that journey looks like and then where everybody kind of lands really at this point. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I have a ton of people that come to us that want all the things like they want a PPC agency and we tell them we, we only do Google. So where you and I are kind of competitors, we're also kind of not because we don't do that. And I'd say for anybody watching or listening, if you want a full spectrum PPC agency, like you know, meets reputation is truly unparalleled. Like I, I, it got a little creepy to be honest with you. It was sort of like, is this a cult that I'm being introduced to? Like why, why is everybody so obsessed with her? So you tell me, what do you, achieve? this is the hardest question in the world to answer. What do you attribute Honest, your popularity to? Like what, what, what is it that, that resonates with people? Honest, I think it's because I'm just so open about everything. And I, I think I really do make it easy for people to talk to me. Because I, and this was years and years ago, and I didn't even realize that I did this, where I 
as a teenager, I was very, obviously, like all of us, we were very, very awkward, but I was very, very quiet. Like, like wouldn't really talk unless I'm screaming at my parents really at this point. And that was the end of it. So my parents obviously have a different opinion on that. But um, I, when I was going through that, I learned how to observe people a little bit better and like actually figure out how to identify what triggers them, which mm -hmm. I think is why I led down the PPP path. Cause I'm like, it kind of does the same thing where you're looking at what they're doing online and figuring out why they did what they did. Uh, and then I started realizing that I had no people skills at one point and I went, okay, so how do I make friends? <laughs> Everyone hates me because I'm so mean to them. Like, how do I go make friends? So I started pretending that I knew them prior to even ever meeting them. So it was almost like, I've known you for 10 years in my head in a sense. So then I'd walk in and I wouldn't have any jitters. I would pretend that we knew each other. So I'd bring up things that I might've saw online as if I should already know this. Uh, and all of that, and that kind of slowly started making people more comfortable with talking to me. And now I just continue to do it. So I just talk to them about like, somebody will send a random DM and I'll just start talking about their day. And I'm like, I don't care. Like most people would leave it and be like, here's your answer. Go off and do whatever you else, whatever else you have to do. For me, I'm like, no, let's actually have that conversation. Let's talk about our day and let it progress into something else. Uh, and that's how I, 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 that's what I think is why I, people like me to a certain degree, which is still a weird feeling for me. Cause I'm like, no, I still think I'm still 15. And I'm like, no, you're supposed to hate me. Like, why do you like <laughs> I'm me? I'm pulling my hair right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Like, I love that. What a good note. I pretend that I know them. I think I'm going to steal that from you. It like works. Like if you just yeah. welcome them with like open arms and just a massive smile, more often than not, people are just like, okay, guard down. We're going to, we're going to move forward. And, um, I think that's probably why a lot of people are so comfortable asking me questions whenever they get stuck and stuff like those kind of things because they're just like well she'll answer it she'll try her best at the very least she's a friend of mine in a sense mm -hmm. uh and that's that's the aim really at this point i want thousands of friends i don't want to talk to them every single day but <laughs> <laughs> i want thousands of friends on call for when i need them <laughs> basically or when that's they need of, me that's really what social people. media is right it's yeah. like you're here when i need you and then i put you away whenever i do <laughs> exactly for me i'm like if i had my core like five people that i talk to on a weekly daily basis we're good but everybody else is kind of funny because a friend of mine actually texted me the other day and he's like where exactly in this world are all your friends and i'm like i do not know and he's like that's a bad friend and i'm like do you know how many people i talk to there's no way i could know where everybody is <laughs> that's awesome i that's uh, so you remember I, I remember i think it was t-mobile do you remember t-mobile had like the five friend the circles yeah. So here's what's sad and pathetic is I, I don't, I think I was like 17 years old. I didn't have I didn't have five people to put in my circles. Like it was like my mom, you know, and it was just, Oh God, it was so embarrassing. Um, so I feel your pain as far as like being awkward. I haven't found my way out of it though. I'm still just, I've just, just chosen to live here. I think you actually like, it works well for you though. It plays like the awkwardness is kind of endearing. It's like, all right, he's like a sick puppy. We got to take care of him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> PPC has changed more in the last 18 months than the entire time I've been in the world. Would you, is that, is that a statement that you'd agree with? The wholeheartedly, almost to, it kind of, it's been interesting because I've been thinking about it a lot more lately and I'm almost wondering if we're going backwards. Yeah. Who's losing all the data? Like this, yeah. Like, yeah. I just like, so we're basically turning into radio and television at this point, but they are to us today. So I'm like, well, then what's next? Like, how do we, that's my question for you you stole it yeah so where do you see this going where where are we heading like what's the you know flash forward if you were to if you were to just take a guess crystal ball 18 months from now what does the ecosystem look like honestly i don't see facebook fixing anything they had so much time to prepare for the ios 14 update and they did nothing mm -hmm. and i know that it's really easy for us to say screw tim cook we hate him he's such an asshole but no screw zuckerberg really at this point like they had so much time. And even if you look at their platform now, there's so many things that they could do to make life easier for people, but they have such a convoluted process in terms of getting account uh, access, pixel, catalogs, everything else is like, you have to go through four or five steps just to do one thing. And it's just the most irritating. So what I see happening is a lot of people divesting from Facebook and moving into platforms like maybe Pinterest, Snapchat, where Snapchat's actually done a really good uh, job of getting people to opt into the allowing like privacy, um, allowing for the 
oh gosh, what is it? Just allowing for, asking users to allow for us to have their info. I guess yeah, the, the tracking. The tracking side of things. Um, they've done a really good job of it. So I think that a lot of, a lot of those brands that were killing it on Facebook likely will start moving down that way just because chances are in 18 months, Snapchat's going to have more information than any of us, I mm. think. Just based off of like what I've seen in terms of getting people to opt in. I, Google, Google's an interesting one because they announced that they're not going to uh, do the cookie list uh, stuff in 2022. So whatever month it was. And now they're moving it to 2023. And at this they point, they moved it again. I didn't know this. Yeah, it got moved to 2023. When was this announcement? I want to say like a cut three, four weeks ago. Oh God, that's what is this? The 15th time they've moved it? Something like that. This one was like the big announcement, and I almost cried. I'm not gonna lie because I was like, yes, finally. That's so funny. Yeah, I don't have to race to figure out what's going on, right? And I think for them, it's just because of all of the all of the lawsuits that are going on and now they're just going, okay, well, we have all of this to handle. We have to make all these changes for the EU. And now we have to, or we said that we were going to make these changes in the, the North American side of things. So I think they're just trying to pace themselves. But now we have, what, two years before they do anything in terms of tracking. And at that point, what do we know is going to happen? So my hunch is that eventually, and I'm really, really hoping that they just give up on it. They just go, forget it. We're not going to do Doubling it. Doubling down on this. So I've been, that's one of my favorite topics for our YouTube channel and something that I think our, our, our listeners are, listeners, viewers, watchers, subscribers. There we go. Subscribers. Yeah. Subscri <laughs> I got there. Our subscribers are fatigued by um, is Flock. I think that, that Flock is there's elements of it that are actually really positive and I haven't talked about those enough, but there's elements of it that terrify me because it's, I don't think it really does much to protect anybody's privacy truly. And all it does is it, it empowers Google from an automation perspective. It disempowers small advertisers specifically. Large advertisers can spend into an ecosystem and purchase the data necessary to get kind of close to that threshold. But I, I view it as like a, a total chicken little scenario. I'm curious as to whether or not you'd talk me out of that or if you have like a similar. No, it's the same thing. Even when we were watching uh, Google Marketing Live, all you could see was case studies of larger brands. Right. That was it. There was no small business in there that was spending less than, I mean, a million or even. $10, yeah, the smallest case study I saw was a hundred thousand dollars a month. Yeah, like most small businesses can't afford that. A lot of um, the clients that I started working with could barely do five hundred to a thousand dollars a month, let alone a hundred grand. There's no way. Yeah. Uh, so I, it, it almost feels like all of these platforms are trying to kill small businesses somehow. <laughs> but like, I just don't, I just don't see what the end game is. Like eventually at one point, yes, we've got all the big corporations working uh, and making all the money, but eventually at one point, like, that's not going to be enough. Eventually something's going to run out and there's not going to be the small local uh, brands that are going to want to help us and give us that customer service that we want. If you keep on trying to edge them out on the platforms too, right? So it's been kind of interesting sitting around looking at all of that. And I'm like, okay, well, if Facebook's trying to kill small business and Google seems to be wanting to kill small business, like, what do we do eventually at what point? Like, something, yeah, something's going to give. Like, I just don't, it's very hard for me to see it. Just I don't see it as being a, like a positive outcome for everybody. Uh, but it's just one of those things that it, it's just really terrifying, honestly. I'm just like, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night. And I know that sounds weird, but it really does. I'm constantly worried. Constantly. Oh, I'm 100% with you. You know, it's funny. I, I feel guilty saying this. I actually think that they've done agencies a favor. I think that the agency days were numbered prior to all of this. You know, we had three to five years on the horizon because it was getting so easy to automate stuff. And the education out there was, was awesome. And some of the software tools even, like some of the tools used to really suck. And now I look at them like, all right, some of these recommendations kind of make sense. And then these sweeping changes that they're bringing about you can't run a campaign by yourself. You need someone that has, you know, view into like five or 10 or 50 or hundred different campaigns so they can, they can see how they're all being impacted. Um, so sucks for our clients, but it's, you know, it's nice for us. They just extended our lifespan just a little. Yeah. Honestly, thinking about what I'm going to do in the future has been like a big thing where I'm like, is this it? Is this the rest of my life? Like, <laughs> I know it's a horrible way to like phrase it, but I like I have this conversation with you and pretty frequently where I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm like, what if I shut up down the agency one day and go, forget it, this is enough, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm like, what do I do with my life? 
Like I genuinely have no idea. I have no other skill. So it's kind of fascinating to sit there and think about that where I'm like, okay, so agency days are somewhat numbered. And I'm like, and then my own personal career seems to be somewhat numbered. And I'm like, how do you transition out of that to something else? And I'm like, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. It's just constantly, I know it's not the best way to do it, but it's constantly just being terrified on my end where I'm like, okay, well, take it day by day and see what happens. Um, but I don't think that there's ever going to be like a moment where agencies aren't needed. It's just, I think the, the smaller guys are going to start disappearing really at this point and the ones that are working with bigger budgets and stuff like that will likely survive until whenever we have a new form of advertising whatever that might be well i think it's going to be apple i think apple's going to double down i mean all the, what i think what tim cook did is i think it's a master stroke i think it's brilliant i think and obviously it's not just him but like to basically you know dig a moat around his entire data set he's the only one that has it's not like they're they're still tracking everything they're just not giving it to any of the apps so for him to be able to roll out his own you know uh, uh and I, I know apple already has mild advertising channels but like to really they could become one of the the predominant advertising networks overnight and i feel like google has that opportunity as well like we've got chrome we've got youtube we've got google search yeah all the partner sites android phones like they are literally basically the only thing that's everywhere People everywhere so their their network is so huge so for me with all these privacy updates and stuff like that i'm like this is a really great opportunity for you guys to actually carve out a space and be like you know what we're the only option going forward like we have all this information so they could really actually just give us that info back and potentially start making more because the more information advertisers have the more we're going to spend on that platform because we're able to make better decisions so I'm hoping that they'll get there eventually at one point or another. Um, Cause there's so many smart, smart people on that team that like they have to, somebody must have thought of this already. Like I refuse to believe that I'm the first person to think of this. Yeah. I think that Google's, Google's whole small business strategy in my mind has always been things like DSA, Google Express, if that's still a thing. I don't think you can still build Express ads, can you? No, they've got smart bidding now. Which okay. Is not a yeah, which, you know, it's weird to me, you open up the Google platform for the very first time, and they, they, they funnel you into the like the four dummies version, if you want the expert version, you actually have to seek it out. Yeah, and sometimes it's kind of hard to find it. So sometimes like clients will be like, I have an existing account. And I'm like, okay, cool. And they're like, and then I go in and I'm like, where, there's nothing. Where is it? Yeah. What, what happened to it? <laughs> where are your <laughs> buttons? Like, I have no yeah, idea. I'm like constantly looking and I'm like, you guys don't make it easy for us to find it either. I remember the first time, like I went into a smart campaign. I like literally sat there for 20 minutes looking. And I was like, am I stupid? <laughs> Did the platform change that much over a week? Like, how, how is this possible? And then it was one of those moments where I like literally had to go to Google chat and I'm like, can you please tell me where, where to find this? Like, I'm like, I'm having such a hard time. And it was literally anchor text, like this small at the bottom. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like you had like, this is uh, it's just absurd. Completely They're not even absurd. pretending anymore. They're just, you know, just, it's just so underhanded. Um, that's really funny. So, who who makes a good client for you? Like, do you have any niches that you pursue? Any specific, you know, uh, uh, types of businesses, locales? Not necessarily, really. At this point, we we work mainly with like the small to business, I guess, range really more so on the medium size or small to medium size businesses. I should have said so more so on the medium side. Um, but in terms of verticals, we don't really. Like we never really decided to stick to one industry or one vertical or multiples of them, just because I really like learning about random things. Like my favorite thing in the entire world, if I could get paid to go to school, I would never leave. Like I love it. Like math classes, psychology, give me all of them. I want to sit there all day and just like learn how to do random stuff and then oh. have it as like a party trick at the end of it all and be like, let me do this like <laughs> calculus <laughs> equation for you. Uh, so yeah, I'm like a lot of fun at parties if you ever, you know, want to invite me or whatever. Um, <laughs> That's great. I'd rather eat chalk than go back to school. Like I just I hated every minute of it. I loved it. I actually, like I have a diploma, diploma in marketing management. And then I also went back to school and got another one. Cause I was like, I kind of. What did you say was audio engineering? 
Yeah, audio engineering and production. So okay. I actually uh, worked on, I was actually the mastermind behind an EP at one point that was released. Yeah, no and that artist was founded by like Hollister at one point. So he was like playing on the radio and it was really, really cool. Um, I worked on a movie. I don't know if it ever actually saw the light of day though. It was a horrible movie, it was so bad. It was like a zombie movie, but like, oh God, they were all, I think they were all stuck on an island or something. I can't even remember anymore. It was like six years ago. And I like jumped in like head first into all of it. And I was, I literally would go to school from like, I think I was in the afternoon class. So like 12 to four. And then I would go straight to the studio five until 2 a.m. basically. And then come back to school at 8 a.m. just so I could finish my edits. Like I was, I'm so, I feel like I'm weird in this sense. Like I was so neurotic about making sure that all the edits hit at the same, like the proper time. To the point where people got annoyed that I was taking so long. And I'm like, no, even if I can see it, like just even a millisecond, I'm like, it will drive me crazy. That's probably so why I you're think, so good at PPC. Just, I just It just makes sense to me in my head. A lot of people are like, can you teach me how to do it? And I'm like, I don't know if I could. Yeah. So I'm like, I just look at an account and it just, like, it just makes sense. Like the numbers just make sense to me. Uh, and I don't really know how to teach someone that gut feeling really at this point. So even like now, a lot of people are like, do you have a course? And I'm like, no. I'm like, I could teach you how to do it. And I'm like, I'm totally fine with making money off of that. But like, I don't know how to turn you into me. Like, I, I genuinely have no idea. <laughs> like, my mind just works in a way that just goes, oh, let's think of this question. Let's think of this question. But look, let's look here. Let's look there. And I'm like, I don't know how to teach that to somebody really at this point, unless I'm actually actively in the account and you're looking at me while, or like kind of over my shoulder while I'm in the account. And I'm like, that, that doesn't work because we'd have to blur out all the information at that point. Yeah, that's so. Do you know who Naval Ravikant is? He's no. the, he founded Angel at Cove. Does I, I like listening to him? Um, I think he's brilliant, but he said something that I thought was really smart about, about stocks. He goes, I'll never tell you when to buy a stock because then I have to tell you when to sell, which means you basically got to call me every morning and be like, Hey, Naval, am I, am I selling today? And, and I heard that and I'm like, Man, that applies to so many things. Because mm -hmm. I, I shot a course on Google ads, which is for sale. You can go to you versus google.com and buy my course. But here's what's interesting about it is it's, it's half, it's half done. You take the course, you know how to launch the ads. You kind of know how to optimize the ads a little, but everything that I would need to teach you after a certain point is going to be so specific to that geography, that market, that competitor, that, you know what I mean? Like, like you just said, I, I feel like there's there's not much in the way of education. Is I think it helps people like dive into the water. You know, it's like, all right, I pushed you off. You're in there. And now you're going to have to learn to swim or not. But, you know, at a certain point, we just can't do it for you. Um, yeah, I think there needs to be like a, an ongoing support element on that. Because then at yeah. that point, you're basically putting on another full-time job for yourself. And then well, it's happening now. People are asking me questions and I'm just like, I'm not answering that. You know, like, you know, hey, how do I scale this campaign? And I'm like, well, there's there's 500,000 variables here that I need to, you know what I mean? Before you can just slack me this, how do I, yeah. I need to go into your account, spend about 20 hours and then, and then I'll let you know after yeah. that. Like, and then at that point, you're just sitting there going, okay, is this even worth the money? So even a couple of my friends are in Google ads or selling like Google ads courses. And I'm like, I'm like, I, I, I have one. I actually planned one about four years ago. So I think about it there and I'm like, I should have done it four years ago. I would have been like the only person at that point actually selling like a Google ads, like, course and i'm like damn the money i could have made i could have like maybe just retired and not have to do this <laughs> <It does. laughs> so how, how did you learn like where did you did you start with a course you just started poking around no i literally so when i was 19 i started my first company uh in event planning and we were essentially selling tickets so while i was doing that company i was actually still in school for marketing and we had one class on online marketing like email ads content like everything and that was enough to spark some interest in me in terms of Google for whatever reason. I don't know what it was, like what the appeal was. Um, but eventually I started trying to figure out how to sell tickets. And I was like, okay, let's try this ads thing. Like, let's see what happens. And we were spending like maybe 250, 500 a month really at that point, uh, just to sell to like the upcoming events and stuff like that. Uh, and turns out that I was actually pretty good at it. So then I <laughs> eventually went, I hate event planning. I don't want to manage this team of 15 anymore. I hate like our vendors. I, I like the teams, but some of their managers were a pain in my butt. You know, I'm like, I don't want to deal with hundreds of people anymore. Like, I just don't, I don't want to do that. 
Uh, so then eventually I just got certified, posted it on LinkedIn. And then uh, when I was, I guess I was 22, 23 at that point, uh, somebody sent me a message going, you're exactly what we've been looking for. And I was like, no experience? Like, yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, and that's how I ended up at, at Auto Canada, basically. So I went from spending two fifty five hundred a month to four point three million dollars annually, uh, essentially overnight. So they were just looking for somebody. They knew in Edmonton there wasn't anybody who did what I did. So they just went, let's just throw her to the wolves and see what happens. And I got very lucky that I found the Google Partners community. So every time I had questions, I would just pop them over there and be like, okay, well, somebody has more experience than I do somewhere in here, right? Uh, and then I just kept on doing that for several months. And then eventually at one point, they decided to spotlight me as a member for some reason, because they're like, well, you're so active and you're like actually answering questions now and doing all of this stuff. And that was in the span of four months. So I like literally dove in as much as I possibly could mm. just to learn everything really, really, really quickly. And then within six months, they asked me to join their ambassador program. No uh, way. Yeah, it was pretty freaking. I was like one of five Canadians and one of 25 North Americans at that time. Uh, and I think they've sunsetted the program now because that was 2014. But like, it was so cool. It was just so cool because we got to do beta tests that weren't available to anybody. We got to have like an actual line to Google in terms of what we wanted to see happen. They were sending us like the coolest swag. Like I at one point had like 20 backpacks. <laughs> And I was just handing out to people, like, please take it. Like, I can't Because <laughs> they would just automatically be like, okay, everyone gets, like, five or something. And I'm like, okay, that's great. But I'm literally one person. Who am I supposed to give these four backpacks to? And then, like, those Google mugs that they used to send out, I swear to God, I had, like, 500 at one point. I get, I get not anymore, but I used to get these and I have like 50. I don't know if you can oh see Oh my that. gosh, I had hundreds. Yeah. I'm not even joking. They They're were all in my filing cabinet. I just go one through the other through the other. So when they used to do those events, they would send one box. They would send me two to three sometimes. No, that's awesome. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with all of this? So a friend of mine was working at an HR firm. So I gave him the boxes. I'm like, give these to the workers. Cause I'm like, I can't, I don't, I don't know what to do here. So he would like just take a box every single month. And he's like, yeah, people are just randomly taking them. I'm like, that's all I needed. I'm like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. There's just too many. So I've like had USBs, pens, books, obviously. I have a ski ball machine thing coming for me right now. Oh like, yeah. We get the, the Google partner rewards. Yeah. That one I was like so stoked for because I didn't even know that we had rewards like points until a friend of mine was like talking about his bike and he was just like, yeah, I got my Google bike. Now I want a Google sc scooter. I'm like, where the hell did you get that from? And he's like, the partner story. I'm like, oh, we probably have points there. And then I just went nuts. And I'm like, yeah, let's go. So I've got like a bike coming for me, the ski ball machine. That's so funny. Well, um, so we had points and we were saying, well, I, here's, I didn't communicate to my staff well. I was saving my points up. And next thing I know, the head of our specialist team, who's a sweet human and was just trying to be nice he's like hey we had all these points so i bought you and john a bunch of stuff and then he like he spent all the points on like knickknacks and i was like no i needed those that's why nobody has access to that partner store i'm the only person who knows about it and i'm like i refuse to let you guys know so my like, these points i'm like they're from like five years ago at this point it feels like and i'm like i refuse to let you take those away from me so it's just, it's always been so funny. I think I've got like three Google minis coming for me as well. Like I just randomly just thought, okay, just give me whatever you want really at this point. It's just, yeah, they had, they had some really cool partner rewards and gifts for us. And I wish Facebook did something similar. Maybe I would like it a little bit more, but. I just, face, you know, we used to run Facebook ads pretty aggressively. Uh, we pulled back for a bunch, honestly, for all the reasons that we see now, but just they were happening prior to. Facebook was making changes in their dashboard. It makes sense. Conversion tracking was inconsistent. We were just like, look, Google scales, Facebook doesn't. I have a hard time with them. I think that Google, for the most part, I know they're a trillion dollar brand and they're ruining the world in their own way, but I, I've always felt like they kind of do the right things for the right reasons. You know, like they roll something out and I'm like, all right, you know, they, they just don't seem like they're, they're as aggressively evil. And Facebook is the flip. It's just like as much as they can get away from, as much as they can like squeeze out of advertisers, you know, like they're just, you know, banning people's, business managers and just doing all this crap and it's like how do you how do you sleep at night you know if you're if you're above tier over there if you're on the executive staff you've got to know what kind of cesspool that is it actually every single year 
right around Black Friday is when my account gets disabled. Every yeah. freaking year. I, right I, I have to. the plan for it now. Like last year, no, the year before, it was, uh, they gave me some time. So it was like mid October, maybe late October. So I was like, okay, we're good. This year was like literally two weeks before, and they had my account disabled for a full month this time. Yeah. You yeah. And you can't get a hold of anybody, and it doesn't matter how much you spend or who you know. It's... And they're just like, well, we're just running through it. And then, like, I hate that COVID was the excuse for everything, really, at this yeah. point. Like, I can understand it 100%. I can understand it. But it, like, just irks me when everybody, like, well, COVID. And I'm like, no, we've been in this for like a year now. You can't use that as the excuse anymore. We should have right. figured it out by now. Uh, and they were, they, it was the same answer. Oh, COVID has affected the way that we were doing all of this stuff. And I'm like, okay, but like, we spent a, a fair bit of money on your platform. Wouldn't you want me to be up and running at this point? Like, I don't, I don't get it. And thankfully, like, obviously we have other people on the team who can still get access to those accounts, but like, it's almost paralyzing to a point where you're just like, I can't do anything here. Like I literally have nothing. I can't access the accounts because my account's disabled. If I create a new account, they'll disable that one because there's no activity on that page. So they think it's fake. Right. So I'm like, how are we supposed to, do this and like especially for new marketers let's say even the gen z guys like they're not on facebook how are they supposed to navigate through this then like do they have to create a face like obviously they have to create a facebook page but now they have to update it just so they don't get disabled like the logic of it doesn't make any sense to me and i'm like well i understand that you're trying to push people to use your platform more but you shouldn't be pushing your advertisers to use your platform more that doesn't it doesn't like it just doesn't make sense i can't connect that in my head yeah I'm with you. I mean, I'm so grateful to you for hanging out with us. And uh, if people want to follow you, check you out, where do they go? Uh, my favorite platform right now is Instagram. So okay. I am at AdWords Girl on there. That's such a great handle. And then what about your agency? Uh, my agency is called Hot Skip Media. So our website is hotskipmedia.com. I have to okay. think about that sometimes. I'm going to put links to both in the description of this video. Um, those words didn't come out entirely, but I'm just going to keep going. And, uh, thanks again for, uh, let me interview you. And I hope that we get to like stay connected and stay buddies and, you know, yes, maybe please. work together, refer, I, I happy to refer work your way if, if, and when it makes sense. And if you know anybody that like, likes awkward, long haired people, maybe you <laughs> send them my direction, but otherwise, um, thanks for hanging out. And if you're watching this video, we shoot a video every single day, like comment, subscribe, do all the things that you already know how to do. And I'll see you tomorrow. Perfect. Thanks for having me.